This is Jefferson Street in Nashville, Tennessee. It sits in the most incarcerated zip code in the United States of America, zip code 37208. This is a startling statistic. A North Nashville neighborhood is said to have the highest incarceration rate in the entire country. Developing now, a North Nashville community is on edge after a deadly shooting. At one point, one in every seven adults living in this zip code would be incarcerated during their 30s. But it wasn't always this way. Jefferson Street is special. It was the place to be in Nashville. It was home to world famous jazz clubs and civil rights think tanks. Folks like Jimi Hendrix and Little Richard, Diane Nash and John Lewis. Some of the biggest and most influential figures in American culture and history got their start right here. In fact, the oldest black owned bank in America is on this street. This place was booming until something horrible happened. This highway. That's Highway 40, and it was built on top of this thriving community in the 1950s and 60s. The construction of this highway completely disrupted this community. It displaced thousands of residents and it upended hundreds of businesses. This process was what was known as urban renewal, and it was very racist. It was something called urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. Getting, it means Negro removal. That is what it means. Urban renewal happened in cities all across the country. So in this video, I want to dig into the racist patterns of urban renewal. And perhaps more importantly, I wanna understand how this thing that happened way back in the past is still affecting us today. And if you stick around at the end, I'll show you some of the work that people are doing to remedy or fix those lasting effects. I'm Garrison and this is Subtext. Okay, so back in the early 1950s, the federal government gave cities billions of dollars to tear down buildings in blighted areas and to replace them with more up-to-date affordable housing. And instead of doing that fairly reasonable thing, it became a government-funded attack on black and Latino communities. And it typically functioned in three phases, displace, demolish and replace. These three elements show up in basically every city that participated in urban renewal. But what I wanna do is pull them apart and look at how each of those three elements impacted black and Latino communities in three different cities. New York City, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Nashville, Tennessee. Let's start with New York, a great example of the first function we'll cover, displacement. There are plenty of examples to draw from, but Lincoln Center stands out as an especially offensive example of the impacts and motivation of urban urban renewal's displacement problem. Around the turn of the 20th century, black residents and Caribbean immigrants started to move into a part of New York City known as San Juan Hill, which was located roughly here in Manhattan. San Juan Hill soon became a neighborhood of bustling creativity. In fact, the neighborhood was so well known that by the 1930s, Duke Ellington and his orchestra had recorded a song named after it. My point is that this wasn't some random slum, which is what makes the rest of this story so tragic. In 1949, President Harry Truman signed this housing act into law. It was sponsored and largely architected by this guy, Senator Robert Taft. Article one of this bill created the legislative groundwork for something called slum clearance, community development and redevelopment, more commonly known as urban renewal. City planners took this bill and all of the money that came with it and went to town. In New York City, it was Robert Moses, a notoriously racist urban planner. Now you might be wondering, how do you know he was racist? Well, he was known as the power broker, a man more influential than anyone else in New York during his prime. And he intentionally designed bridges, roadways, and underpasses to keep bus riders, usually black and Puerto Rican people, from accessing parks and other amenities around the city. Robert Moses was not a good guy. He created systems of exclusion and oppression that exist to this day. I'm still surprised that some people were surprised when I pointed to the fact that uh, if a highway was built for the purpose of di dividing a white and a black neighborhood, or if an underpass was constructed such that a bus carrying mostly black and Puerto Rican kids uh, to a beach uh, in New York was, was designed uh, too low for it to pass by, that that obviously reflects racism that went into those design choices. That's how the Secretary of Transportation talks about Robert Moses's work, which is why this legislation on urban renewal was particularly dangerous in his hands. He appointed himself chair of the New York City Slum Clearance Committee, saying that the committee would address, quote, blighted slums that demanded urban renewal. 
But that urban renewal plan displaced more than 7,000 lower class families and 800 businesses. And almost all of them were black, which means that many of these displaced black New Yorkers were forced to cram into other low income communities, cutting off their access to vital resources and ironically creating new slums in different parts of the city. An additional tragedy in this whole thing is that much of these efforts were predicated on racist tropes and narratives. This poster was plastered all over the city to galvanize public support for this effort. Over the following decades, many of the displaced Black and Puerto Rican people found themselves falling further and further behind economically. That's step one in urban renewal, displacement. And once people are displaced, their homes, their businesses, their stories, their community is often demolished. And a ton of rich history is demolished along with it. I think the best example of this is what happened in our next city, Tulsa, Oklahoma. You've probably heard of the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. It's when an angry mob of white people destroyed a thriving black community. This massacre became the very first time in history where bombs were dropped on American soil. I mean, these bigots went to incredible lengths to demolish this community. The truly amazing thing is that these black folks were so resilient and so wealthy that they rebuilt their entire community in a matter of years. In fact, in just a few months of the 1,256 homes that were destroyed, 764 of them were already being rebuilt. In fact, this community became became known as Black Wall Street after the rebuild. And make no mistake about it, this was only made possible because the Supreme Court of Oklahoma blocked the plans of the mayor of Tulsa, Oklahoma. His plan was to seize the land, demolish any remaining buildings, and build a railroad on top of it. That's him, that's what he looks like, that's the mayor and founder of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was also a member of the KKK. This was 1921, but just 45 years after the Tulsa race massacre, urban renewal arrives with the same plan, same outcomes, but a new method. In the 1950s and 60s, the city of Tulsa put together a plan to seize the land in the Greenwood District again, and this time they were successful. Under urban renewal legislation, they demolished acres of land, homes, businesses, schools. I mean, this is the Greenwood District in 1950, and here it is in 2020. This highway cuts straight through the heart of the community, making the place nearly unlivable on purpose. Which brings us to the third and final phase of urban renewal, replacement. We don't really have to look anywhere else to tell this part of the story. In Tulsa, black neighborhoods were entirely disrupted by this highway. And more often than not, that's what happened with urban renewal. Black and Latino folks were displaced, their entire communities demolished, and then they'd be replaced by a highway. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, examples abound. But I wanna go back to where we started in Nashville, the place where I live. This community in North Nashville was devastated by the highway that cut it in half. Now, the interstate was a poison that continued to affect that community in low doses even after that initial hit. And you're seeing the residue of that today. And to be clear, this highway didn't replace a slum. It barreled through a thriving black neighborhood. It was kind of like the main artery in the heart of black Nashville. North Nashville is in the position that it's in today because of decades of harmful and frankly racist policies. And urban renewal was one of those policies. And before folks from other cities look down on Nashville, the same can be said about almost any city in America with a sizable black population. Like Atlanta, where I'm from, Boston, Buffalo, DC, Houston, Minneapolis, New York, Oakland, Philadelphia, and countless others participated in this racist initiative. Racism shaped American cities and the impacts are right in front of us. Okay, thankfully some cities are taking the necessary steps to right that wrong. The cities of San Francisco and Evanston, Illinois name urban renewal explicitly in their reparations proposals. The activists in Asheville, North Carolina see urban renewal as a central part of the case that they're making for reparations. The reality is that communities will have to address these harms in their own ways. But one thing is for certain. These wrongs must be righted. Okay, thanks for watching. We crammed a ton of information into this video. So if you're watching this right now, thank you so, so much for sticking around. Be sure to like this video. It gives it a really, really huge boost. At Subtext, we are telling stories about things just beneath the surface. And so if you're interested in that, this is the place where you should be. Consider subscribing. Okay, that's it for this one. See you in the next one. Peace.